Hello and welcome back to our series on electrical and computer engineering. Our conversation tonight is about circuit equivalence, Thevenin and Helmholtz and Norton equivalence. You see, electric and electronic circuits, major ones, are not created as a finished entity. No, they are not. They are designed, built and tested one part at a time. And with each new part, we bring it in plug it with a tested part at two nodes, and then solve the entire network to check its correctness. At one point, the whole network has so many nodes, so many branches, and so many components, that even the brainiest and most powerful of our computers would crawl down through its solution and sometimes just stop dead on its track, overwhelmed by the complexity of the whole circuit. In these cases, simple series and parallel simplifications, even when augmented with wide delta conversions and source transformations, is just not enough. In these cases, we need to bring in the cavalry. We need to bring in Thevenin and Helmholtz and Norton equivalents. You see, when we have a massive and complicated linear network that is going to be connected at a pair of nodes to a new network, even a non-linear new network, we can replace the original, the linear network, by just one resistor and one source. No kidding. Awesome, huh? And the new network will not notice a change if we do it right. If we do it the way that we were taught by Thevenin, Helmholtz, and Norton. Are you not chomping at the bit to see how this is done? If you're a little bit like me, I'm sure that you are. So, let's begin. Real life circuits are large. They are huge. But the good news is they are built one part at a time. They build first a little part test it, and then they build a second part, connect that to the existing and already tested one, and test the whole thing again, and so on and so forth, until they finish the whole circuit. We do not need, at every stage, the whole detail of the circuit simulation. We don't. What we need is the detailed behavior of only the new part that is connected to the part of the circuit that has already been proven right, proven correct. Wouldn't it be nice if we could replace all the part of the circuit that has already been tested by a simple equivalent circuit so we could concentrate the power of our computer on only that new part of the circuit that we have just introduced? Well, guess what? In the 19th century, the genius of Professor Hermann Ludwig Ferdinand von Helmholtz, and 30 years later and independently, French engineer Leon Charles Thevenin gave us their way of producing such a simple equivalent circuit. They said, for a given circuit, at a pair of nodes, the circuit can be replaced by just one voltage source in series with a resistor. Let's see more about that. A few years later, the American engineer Edward Lorry Norton and the German scientist Hans Ferdinand Meyer came up with an alternative to the Helmholtz Thevenin equivalent, one current source in parallel with a resistor. Before we begin, let's have a little bit of nomenclature. Port. What is a port? If we have a circuit, to connect anything to that circuit, we need at least two nodes of connection. That pair of nodes is what we defined as a port, and the new network is docked into that port. So what we do is we extrude some wires out of given nodes, they could even be binary nodes, and we connect an external circuitry to that port P, Q, X, T, Y, Z. Two nodes, one port. How many ports do you see in the figure? If you say 3, you're thinking of P, Q, X, T, and Z, Y. But what about Q, T? What about P, T? 
thinking with that where you realize, hmm, this reminds me a little bit of high school combinatronics. What we need is to find a way of counting how many combinations, two at a time, we have out of six notes. When the order is not important, that was 15 possible ports given six notes. And now we introduce four more ideal circuit elements. First one, the open circuit. A few lectures ago, we introduced the ideal resistor, the ideal inductor, and the ideal capacitor, along with six different types of ideal sources. Today, we bring in other four ideal elements. The first one is the ideal open circuit. An open circuit is defined by its behavior. What behavior is that? Its current is zero at all times. What symbol we use for an open circuit? Just a hole in the branch where we put the open circuit like that. The current is zero, and the voltage across the open circuit is what we call the open circuit voltage VOC, just like that. Another element, the short circuit. It is an element represented by its behavior. Its voltage is always zero. The symbol we use is just a wire between the two nodes at which we're connecting that short circuit. The voltage across it is zero, and the current through it is what we call the short circuit current, and that port I sub S C. The ideal ammeter. The ideal ammeter is a short circuit that displays its current. That's correct. Its voltage is zero because it's a short circuit. And the symbol? This is a symbol of an ideal ammeter connected between those two nodes connected at that port. It's telling you what current flows through that, and the voltage across it is zero. A real ammeter has um, an internal resistance that is not quite zero, but is very tiny, probably a few micro-ohms. The ideal voltmeter is an open circuit that displays its voltage. Yes, the internal resistance of an ideal voltmeter is infinity, and its current is zero. It is ideal, all right? The symbol, this one, or that one. The point is the current through an ideal voltmeter is zero. Its internal resistance is infinity. A real voltmeter is not quite like that but it still has a huge internal resistance, somewhere around several hundreds of millions of ohms. So the current is not quite zero, but it's very, very tiny. Now, back to our regular programming. Helmholtz and Thevenin said pretty much something like this. Given a linear network and a port, we can represent that network and that port by one voltage source in series with one resistor. One equivalent per port. Given a network, given a port, one resource, one resistor. The problem here, the task at hand, is to find the value of that source and that resistor. VTH and RTH. The Thevenin voltage and the Thevenin resistance. The classic method of finding the values of VTH and RTH follows two tests, the open circuit test and the short circuit test. Let's see. It all orbits around the fact that if this network, the original one, is truly equivalent to this Thevenin Helmholtz circuit, then whatever voltage I measure in the real life here, VOC, the open circuit, should appear also in the open circuit of the port in the equivalent one VOC. Mm -hmm. So you can measure on the left in the laboratory and know that that voltage is going to be the same between A and B on the equivalent circuit on the right. But uh, what else we can conclude? We know that the current through an open circuit is zero, so the voltage in that resistor, given Ohm's law, has to be zero volts. That allows us to write a cavial equation in that loop and determine that the voltage of the internal source, VTH, has to be the voltage VOC that we measured from the original circuit in the laboratory. So there is your way of finding VTH. Just measure VOC in the lab at the open circuit port 
and that is the value of the V7 and source in the equivalent circuit. Piece of cake. That can be written like this. In the original circuit, the one on the left, measure the open circuit voltage and the port. That gives us directly what should be the equivalent voltage source value of V7 on the right. But you're thinking, wait a minute. What if I don't have a prototype? I can measure voltages out in the lab. What if all I have is a circuit schematics on paper? Well, in that case, instead of measuring, you compute the open circuit voltage using MNA or any other technique at that port. And that open circuit voltage is V7 and the value of the source in the equivalent circuit. This is what we call the open circuit test. Now that we know VTH, how do we compute the resistance RTH? Along the same lines, we say if the original circuit is truly equivalent to the Thevenin and Helmholtz circuit, then if I short the original circuit in the lab and measure the current, the short circuit current, that should be the same current that flows in the Thevenin equivalent if I short circuit it. Oh, so I measure the short circuit current in the lab in the real thing? and uh, say that in the equivalent one, the current should be the same short circuiting. But in the equivalent one, that current is given by Ohm's law. That current is V7 divided by R7. Correct. We know I short circuit because that value was measured in the lab in the real circuits short circuit. And we know V7 that we obtained from the open circuit test. So we solve for R7 and find that R7 is the open circuit voltage divided by the short circuit current. So check this out. This is the way of finding R7. In the real circuit, in the laboratory, we measure the short circuit current and then use that with VOC to find R7. That belongs in the equivalent circuit. In words, in the original circuit, measure the short circuit current at the port then divide the already known V7 by the measured I short circuit to get the equivalent R7. Wait a minute, what if we don't have a prototype? Oh, easy, instead of measuring, we compute using MNA or any other method what is the short circuit current and proceed along the same lines. This is what is called the short circuit test. Now let's go to the laboratory, to a virtual laboratory. And patients, we will do this on paper in a minute or two. But first, just to emphasize the procedure, open circuit, short circuit, let me do that in a virtual lab. Measure VOC and then measure ISC. For this circuit, two sources, one V source 10 volts, one I source 7 amps, two 6 ohm resistor, one 4 ohm resistor. We want the 7 ohm Helmholtz equivalent and the port AB. So we want VOC, the open circuit voltage at A and B, and then the short circuit current between A and B. Let's do that in the laboratory. Let me wire the circuit with the source, one resistor, the other one, the vertical current source, and the vertical resistor. Let me move this resistor a little bit to the right to make room. And now we wire them together. Mm -hmm. But we need a reference node, right? Here is my reference node. Let's continue the wiring. The values of the elements need to be adjusted to the correct one. 10 volts, that's right. This one is 6 ohms, 6 ohms, 4 ohms, and this is 7 amps. And now the multimeter, the multimeter has to be right side up, the positive on the node volts, DC, 100 mega ohms is the internal resistance of that voltmeter. It is not an ideal one, but it's pretty good, right? Connect that to the circuit, connect that to the port to measure the open circuit voltage. There, run the simulation, and this negative 16 volts is VOC, which is also V7, negative 16 volts. Now let's replace that by an ammeter current DC. You see the resistance is one micro ohms. It is pretty much like a wire. Run it 
that is the short circuit current, negative 2.286 amps. With those two, of course, we remember that V7 and is VOC, and R7 and is the ratio between VOC and the short circuit current. Use the values, negative 16 volts for VOC, negative 2.286 for I short circuit, and find that the V7 and is negative 16 volts, and R7 and is 7 ohms. That means that in the equivalent circuit, V7 and is upside down with a value of 16 volts. And the resistance, R7 and, is 7 ohms. Equivalent circuit. Equivalent, really? Let's see. If this is truly equivalent to the original circuit, if we connect a 2 ohm resistor to the port AB to the equivalent, and to the port AB of the original circuit, the same voltage must appear. Isn't that so? It is so. Let's do that. Let's take the original circuit and connect a 2 ohm resistor at the port AB. We need, of course, a voltmeter. We're going to measure just what voltage appears there. Let's do the wiring and run the simulation in a moment just to see what voltage appears across the 2 ohm resistor, negative 3.556 volts. That is fine. Now, let's repeat the experiment connecting the 2 ohm resistor to the equivalent circuit, to the so-called equivalent circuit. If they are truly equivalent, the same voltage must appear at the voltmeter. There is your voltmeter. There is the reference. Do the wiring. Change the values of the elements and run the simulation. changing the values. This is 16 upside down, 7 ohms, and 2 ohms run, negative 3.556 volts. The same voltage appears. So it seems that this circuit is truly the equivalent of the original circuit at that port. So let's uh, recap what is the classic method to find V7 and an R7. Two tests, the open circuit and the short circuit test. The open circuit at the port, we measure or compute the open circuit voltage VOC, and that is directly V7. The short circuit test, short circuit the port, measure or compute the short circuit current ISC, and then do this division. VOC divided by I short circuit is R7. That is a classic method of Thevenin and Helmholtz equivalent. But now let's say uh, that we don't have a prototype for the circuit, so we don't measure VOC, we don't measure I short circuit, we solve for them on paper. Here we go. First we go for VOC. To find VOC at AB, choose a reference, identify the nodes 1 and 2 in this case, branch currents, write your equations, right? 1 and two, one for node two and one for node one. Please check them out. Yeah, the one for node two. 10 minus V2 over six is the current on the left. Minus seven, well, I should have written that positive on the right-hand side, right? But anyway, it's done. Equals two currents leaving V2 over six, V2 minus V1 over four. The KCL equation for node one is currents entering node one, V2 minus V1 over 4 equals to 0, the open circuit current here. Solve for them. There. V1 is negative 16 volts, but V1 is V7, negative 16 volts, same as before. So you see, this is how we do these things on paper. Now let's find the short circuit current. Short circuit. This is my reference, so the top there on the right is also the reference. Identify other nodes. Only one, branch currents, and write only one KCL equation in this case, right? Currents entering, 10 minus V1 divided by 6, leaving 7, V1 over 6, V1 over 4. Sold for V1. And then we find I short circuit, which in this case, is the current in this 4 ohm resistor, which is this current, V1 over 4. 
and we know V1, compute the short circuit current, negative 2.286 amps, same as we did in the circuit simulation. And that's we do those things on paper. Now let me give you a very useful technique, but unfortunately it works only sometimes. If all the sources in the circuit are independent, in that case, instead of doing a short circuit test to find our Thevenin, no, we just kill the sources and whatever equivalent resistance we see at the port, that is our Thevenin. What about the open circuit test? No one will save us from the open circuit test. We still need to do the open circuit test to find VOC and with that V Thevenin, but no short circuit test for these circuits. Kill all the sources, find the equivalent resistance. Let's do that for this circuit. Kill the source, the voltage source becomes a wire, right, like so. The current source becomes an open circuit. The equivalent resistance seen on the port is 4, in series with 6, in parallel with 6, which is 3, 3 and 4 is 7, 7 is the 7 and resistance. Unfortunately, it is very sweet method works only when all the sources are independent. Tutorial time. Let's find the Thevenin equivalent of this very simple circ. Find VOC at the port AB. Sure. Instead of solving that with a Monet, I will say I can use a, a voltage divider and find VOC would be 15 times 60 divided by 160. And that is 5.625 volts. That is VOC, that is V7. And now the short circuit. Find the short circuit current. Okay. That current is going to be, let's say, let's say I need this short circuit current, right? Reference, but this is also the reference. So the current on the left, I sub A, is reference voltage minus reference voltage plus 15 divided by 100. And that is 0 0.15 amps. Mm -hmm. That current arrives on the top and finds the current divider between the 60 ohm resistor and the 0 ohm short circuit. We use a current divider there and say the current here on the right, the short circuit current, is a total current 0.15 amps multiplied by the resistance in the other branch, 60, divided by the sum of the resistance 0 plus 60, that is 0.15 amps. All the current goes through the short circuit. And that's how we find that. Now, R7 is VOC 5.625 divided by the short circuit current 0.15 amps, and that is 37 and a half ohms. That is not the only way of solving that, of course. We could have said something like this, something like this. What is the current IB? Oh, that current is the current in an R branch connected between the reference and the reference, and that, of course, is zero. Zero minus zero divided by 60, zero amps. And then we use KCL and this little Gauss surface we say I short circuit is I sub A plus I sub B and that is just 0.15 amps and the rest is the same. Now to finish the circuit we always have to draw the equivalent circuit. There's your V7 and 5.6 volts. There's your R7 and 37 and a half ohms. The second part, the short circuit test, we could have um, obviated if we just had noticed that the only one source is an independent source. We just kill that source and find the equivalent resistance, which is 60 in parallel with 100 seen on the port. 60 times 100 divided by 160, and that is 37.5 ohms. Easier, but works only with circuits that have only independent sources. Tutorial time two. Only round sources. Again, same case, but a more interesting circuit. Fine VOC. Fine. Reference, node one, node two. Branch currents, write your equations. There is no CTL equation. There is no evil equation, only 
two KCL equations for node 1 on the right. Check it out. V2 minus V1 over 3 equals 2, the current in this uh, RV branch, V1 minus 9 divided by 3. And KCL2, 3 currents, 7 amps going in, V2 over 2 going out, V2 minus V1 over 3 coming out too. Enter that in the calculator, solve for that, and we get that V1, that is VOC, is 10.875 volts and that is just v7 and according to what we've seen before so much for v7 right let's find r7 for r7 because the circuit has only independent sources we do not need the short circuit test we just kill the sources the 7 amp source becomes an open circuit the 9 volt source becomes a short circuit and the equivalent resistance at the port ab is this 3 ohm resistor in parallel with a series of 3 and 2. You say, wait a minute, how is that? Well, because there is no current in this 2 ohm resistor, I can obviate that. Delete, delete, now it's clear, right? The equivalent resistance is 3 in parallel with 5, which is 1.875 ohms. And that is the equivalent 7 and Helmholtz circuit for the original one. 7 and voltage, 10.9 volts, 7 and resistance 1.9 ohms. Tutorial time 3. This is a weird circuit. It has only controlled sources. Let me tell you one thing. When there is no independent source in the circuit, all voltages and all currents are zero because there is no initiator in the circuit. The voltage VOC has to be zero. What? You don't believe me, eh? No problem. That is good, because you are going to be engineers. You don't believe. One has to show you. Let me show you. Let me solve that circuit using a reference node, node 1, node 2, branch currents. I write my CTL equation. Of course, there is a CTL equation for the controlling variable Vx. Vx is just V2. And then KCL equations for node 1 and node 2. Enter them in the calculator, solve for them. And look, V1, which is VOC, is 0, and that is V7. That is 7. That means that a circuit that has only controlled sources has an equivalent circuit that includes only one single and solitary resistor. We need to find that resistor. If we were to apply a short circuit test to that circuit, the current would be zero and we would be nowhere near to finding R7 and we cannot divide zero by zero. So what do we do? We observe that the equivalent circuit is going to be something like this, only a resistor. How do we find that? Well, if we apply, for instance, a current source of a known value like one amp, that one amp current will produce a voltage drop in the resistor of VA, which is 1 amp times R7, right? The voltage that appears has the same numerical value as the resistance because the current is 1 amp. You say, that's how I'm going to find R7. Apply 1 amp to the actual circuit, measure the voltage, and that voltage VA is going to have the value of my internal R7 resistor. Apply 1 amp and solve for VA. Let's see. Reference, right? Notes 1 and 2, branch currents, and I write the CTL equation and the 2KCL equations. Solve for and find that V1, which is VA, is 1.219. V1 is VA, and VA is the value of R7, and 1.219 ohms. That is the 7 and equivalent of this circuit at the port AB. Tutorial time 4. This is a circuit that has everything on the cook in it. Controlled sources, independent sources, and a bunch of resistors. Let's find VOC. MNA, reference node, node 1, node 2, branch currents. A CTL equation for VX. VX is V2. Case hill for node 1. Case hill for node 2. 
enter them in the calculator, solve and you find that V1, which is V7 and is 4 volts, 0.179. That is V7 and 4.179 volts. Now for the short circuit. Find this current here. Reference node. Well, the short circuit will propagate that reference all the way to the top. All of that is my reference. And now we identify nodes, only one, branch currents, and write your KCL equation, right? CTL equation, KCL equation, solve, and you find that V1 is really zero. But now check it out, check it out. V1 is zero. This voltage is zero here. If this voltage is zero because it's the references. The current here on the top on the 3 ohm resistor is zero minus zero divided by three. This is zero amps. The current on the vertical branch here is V of the reference minus V of the reference plus nine divided by three. What is the value of X? It is the current in an RV branch. Voltage of the origin, zero volts minus voltage of the destination reference to zero volts plus nine volts, which is helping the current, that is three amps. So we have zero amps from the left, three amps from the bottom. The current in the short circuit wire is given by KCL, three amps. We have VOC and we have short circuit current. So the seven and resistance is 4.179 volts, which is the open circuit voltage divided by the three amps of the short circuit current, 1.393 ohms. That is your seven and equivalent of the port AB for that circuit. 4.179 volts, 1.393 ohms. That is not the only way of doing business with equivalent circuits. No, it isn't. Edward Lorry Norton from the USA and Hans Ferdinand Mayer from Germany, they came up with an alternative. They said, given a circuit and a port, we can represent the circuit just with one resistor in parallel with a current source, something like that. We need to find that current source. I'll call that the Norton current and the resistance, the Norton resistance. Call that the Meyer current or the Meyer resistance if you if you wish. If this circuit is equivalent to this one according to Meyer and Norton, we have to find what is the value of that Norton current and this Norton resistance. Let's see how we do that. We will apply the same two tests, the open circuit test to find VOC and the short circuit test to find the short circuit current. What do we do with them? This is the short circuit test find in the actual circuit and in the equivalent one. The short circuit current appears here. The same current should appear in the short circuit on the right hand side, on the equivalent circuit. But now we can measure the one on the left or compute it if it's a paper drawn circuit. And on the right, there is a conclusion. Check this out. Check this out. What is the current in the RN resistor? Is an R branch? between the same node, between the reference node and the reference node, that current in Rn is zero. So that means that the short circuit current has to be, this current is zero, right? So that means that using a KCL equation on the top junction, we conclude that a short circuit is just the Norton current. So the procedure is, in the real world, measure the short circuit current and that's going to be the value of the Norton current source, this one. And for R Norton? Well, we perform then the open circuit test. If they are equivalent, whatever voltage appears in the actual circuit VOC appears in the equivalent one. So we measure VOC from the real circuit and then we move it over to the equivalent one and say, I know the Norton current already, which is the short circuit current of the previous test. How do I find Rn? Well, because there is an open circuit on the right, the current here on this little piece of wire is zero. So that means that all the Norton current has to flow downwards through the Norton resistor in open circuit. And that voltage, yeah, is going to be Rn times In, 
that is the open circuit voltage. We measure VOC, we already have I Norton from before, we find the Norton resistance, which is same as before, open circuit voltage divided by short circuit current. Just a note, some circuits have a Norton equivalent and some have a Thevenin equivalent and many have both, but sometimes some circuits have only one of the two. In the case when the circuit can be represented by either of the two equivalents, you can go from one to the other according to our lecture on source transformations. I leave with you a couple of exercises for your practice. We have already done the open and short circuit test on the circuit below and they are given by this VOC and II short circuit. Find the Norton equivalent current IN at the port PQ as drawn below. Please observe the direction for the Norton current in the equivalent. Huh? And another exercise, pretty much the same. Find the value of the Norton resistance at the port. And that is all, my invisible friends. Thank you very much and I hope you enjoyed this video as much as I did preparing it. I hope to meet you again in our next movie.